Welcome to Paranormal Pages. Let's get straight into the true scary stories. Story 1. The Other Me. I first saw it on a rainy Thursday evening. The downpour had been relentless all day, casting a gray pall over our small town. I was driving home from work, my mind fogged by exhaustion and the rhythmic patter of rain on the windshield. As I rounded a corner near the old, abandoned textile mill, I caught sight of a figure standing by the road. It was me. My heart raced as I pulled over, unable to believe my eyes. The figure was identical to me in every way, same brown hair, same blue raincoat, even the same weary expression. I rolled down my window, but the figure simply stared back at me, its eyes hollow and devoid of life. The sight sent a chill down my spine, and I quickly drove off, glancing in the rearview mirror. It was still there, watching, as if it knew something I didn't. When I got home, I tried to rationalize what I had seen. Maybe it was a trick of the light, a reflection, or just my tired mind playing tricks on me. But deep down, I knew it was something more. My wife, Emily, noticed my agitation. You look like you've seen a ghost, she said with a concerned smile. I forced a laugh, not wanting to worry her. Just a long day at work, I replied, but the image of my doppelganger lingered in my mind. The next few days were uneventful and I began to convince myself that the encounter had been a figment of my imagination. Then, one evening, Emily mentioned something that made my blood run cold. I ran into you at the grocery store today, she said casually over dinner. You didn't seem to recognize me at first, which was odd. Are you okay? My fork clattered to my plate. Emily, I wasn't at the grocery store today. I was at work all day. Her face paled, and an uneasy silence settled between us. That night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. I kept replaying Emily's words in my mind, trying to make sense of it. Had she really seen my doppelganger? And if so, what did it want? The following week, things took a turn for the worse. My best friend, Mark, called me in a panic. What's going on with you, man? You've been acting really weird lately, he said. I saw you at the park today, but you ignored me completely. Are you mad at me or something? I assured him that I hadn't been anywhere near the park and tried to calm him down, but my own anxiety was mounting. My doppelganger was not just an eerie apparition. It was actively taking over my life. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I started keeping a detailed journal of my daily activities, noting every place I went and everyone I saw. I asked Emily and Mark to do the same, to help me track the movements of my double. But despite our efforts, the sightings continued. It seemed to be everywhere, always one step ahead, slipping through my life like a shadow. The final straw came when Emily woke me in the middle of the night, her eyes wide with terror. I heard you talking in the living room, she whispered, her voice trembling. But you were right here, asleep beside me. I grabbed the baseball bat I kept under the bed and crept downstairs, my heart pounding in my chest. The living room was empty, but the air was thick with an otherworldly presence. I could feel it watching me, waiting. Hey! Subscribe for more true scary stories. The air in the living room was heavy, oppressive, like the atmosphere before a storm. I stood there, clutching the bat, my eyes darting around the shadows. Nothing moved, but the sensation of being watched was overwhelming. Emily had followed me downstairs, her presence a small comfort in the otherwise chilling room. We need to find out what this is, she whispered, her voice shaking. I nodded, my mind racing with questions and dread. The next morning, we decided to visit the town library, 
hoping to find some historical context for our situation. Mrs. Hawthorne, the librarian, greeted us warmly, though her smile faded when we explained what we were looking for. Doppelgangers, she echoed, her brow furrowing. That's quite unusual. But there are old tales and local legends about them. She led us to a dusty section of the library filled with folklore and paranormal accounts. We spent hours poring over the books, piecing together fragments of stories and myths. One account stood out, a tale about a man in our town who had encountered his double in the early 1900s. According to the story, the doppelganger had slowly taken over his life, replacing him in the eyes of his loved ones until the man was driven to madness. My hands trembled as I read, the parallels to my own experience chilling me to the core. Emily found another book, this one detailing rituals and protections against malevolent spirits. Look at this, she said, pointing to a passage about using personal items to create a protective barrier. We need to try this. Desperation made us willing to try anything, so we gathered candles, salt, and personal items, photographs, keepsakes, anything imbued with our essence. That night, we performed the ritual, encircling our home with a line of salt and lighting the candles. It felt like a feeble attempt, but it was all we had. For a few days, the sighting stopped, and a fragile peace settled over us. I dared to hope that we had succeeded, that the doppelganger had been banished. But the sense of unease never fully left me. One evening, as I was finishing up some work in my home office, I heard Emily scream from the kitchen. I rushed to her side, finding her standing in the middle of a broken circle of salt, the candles extinguished. It was here, she gasped. It was right here, in our home. The fragile piece shattered. The doppelganger was becoming bolder, more brazen. It was no longer content with mere sightings, it was invading our sanctuary. We knew we had to act quickly, but we were running out of ideas. Mark, ever the skeptic, suggested we consult a medium. It's worth a shot, he said, though his voice lacked its usual confidence. Desperation and fear had taken hold of all of us. We found a local medium, Madame Celeste, whose reputation for dealing with the supernatural was well known in the area. Her shop was filled with the smell of incense and the soft glow of candles. She listened intently as we recounted our story, her expression grave. Doppelgangers are rare, but they're dangerous, she said. They thrive on fear and chaos. We need to confront it directly. Madame Celeste agreed to perform a seance at our home. That night, the atmosphere was tense as we gathered in the living room, the candles casting flickering shadows on the walls. Madame Celeste began the ritual, her voice low and melodic, calling out to the spirit that haunted us. The air grew colder, and a palpable sense of dread filled the room. It's here, she whispered, her eyes widening. Prepare yourselves. The room was deathly silent as Madame Celeste's voice resonated, her chant growing louder and more insistent. I held Emily's hand tightly, feeling her tremble beside me. The candles flickered violently, casting grotesque shadows on the walls. My breath caught in my throat as a cold breeze swept through the room, extinguishing the candles in an instant. We were plunged into darkness, save for the dim glow of the streetlights outside. Suddenly, a figure materialized in the middle of the room, its form dark and indistinct. My heart pounded as the figure took on a more defined shape. It was me, but twisted and distorted, with eyes that seemed to pierce through my very soul. Why are you doing this? I demanded, my voice shaking. The doppelganger's lips curled into a sinister smile. Because you don't deserve the life you have, it hissed. I do. Madame Celeste stepped forward, 
her eyes blazing with determination. You have no power here, she intoned, raising her hands. Be gone, spirit, and trouble this family no more. The doppelganger laughed, a sound that sent chills down my spine. You cannot banish me so easily, it sneered. I am tied to him, to his very essence. I am a shadow, and I will take what is mine. Emily gripped my hand tighter, her voice barely a whisper. We have to fight it together, she said, her eyes pleading with me to be strong. I nodded, drawing on the strength of her love and our shared determination. This is my life, I said, stepping toward the doppelganger. You can't have it. The figure's eyes narrowed, and for a moment, I saw a flicker of doubt. Madame Celeste continued her incantations, the air thick with tension. The doppelganger began to waver, its form flickering like a dying flame. You are not welcome here, I shouted, feeling a surge of defiance. Leave us alone. The figure recoiled, its smile faltering. This isn't over, it snarled, but there was a hint of uncertainty in its voice. With a final, deafening roar, the doppelganger dissolved into the air, leaving us gasping in the aftermath. The candles flickered back to life, casting a soft glow over the room. Madame Celeste slumped into a chair, exhausted but triumphant. It's weakened, she said, her voice hoarse. But it's not gone. You need to find out why it's tied to you, and break the connection. The following days were a blur of research and anxiety. I combed through old family records, trying to uncover any clue that might explain the doppelganger's origin. Emily and I retraced our steps, visiting the old textile mill where I had first seen the figure. It was there, amid the decaying machinery and crumbling walls that we found a journal hidden in the ruins. The journal belonged to a distant relative of mine, a man named Samuel who had worked at the mill in the early 1900s. His entries detailed a pact he had made with a dark entity, a desperate attempt to save the failing mill and his own dwindling fortune. The entity had promised success, but at a terrible cost, the lives of his descendants would be haunted by a doppelganger a shadow self that would seek to replace them. My blood ran cold as I read Samuel's final entry, a plea for forgiveness and a warning to anyone who might find the journal. The curse can be broken, he wrote, but it requires a sacrifice. Only by facing the shadow and renouncing the pact can the cycle be ended. I realized with a sinking heart that I would have to confront the doppelganger again this time to end its hold over me once and for all. Armed with Samuel's journal and the knowledge of the curse, I felt a mix of dread and determination. The solution seemed clear, but the path was fraught with peril. Emily and I prepared for the final confrontation, gathering the necessary items for the ritual Madame Celeste had described. We needed a place of significance, where the veil between our world and the supernatural was thin. The old textile mill, where the curse had been born, was the perfect location. We arrived at the mill just before midnight, the air thick with anticipation. The moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie light over the decaying structure. Emily and I set up a circle of protection with salt and candles, placing the journal and a photo of Samuel in the center. Madame Celeste had agreed to join us, her presence a comforting reminder that we weren't facing this alone. As we lit the final candle, a cold wind swept through the mill, extinguishing the flames. The shadows around us deepened, and I felt the familiar chill of the doppelganger's presence. It materialized before us, its eyes burning with malice. You cannot win, it snarled, its voice echoing through the empty mill. I am bound to you by blood and shadow. I stepped forward, holding the journal aloft. I know about the pact, I said, my voice steady despite my fear. I renounce it. 
I will not let you take my life. The doppelganger laughed, a sound that grated against my nerves. Words are not enough, it hissed. You must sacrifice something precious, something of great personal value. My mind raced, trying to think of what the entity meant. Emily squeezed my hand, her eyes filled with understanding. It's me, she whispered. I'm the sacrifice. My heart ached at the thought. I couldn't lose her, not after everything we had been through. There must be another way, I pleaded, but the doppelganger's grin widened. There is no other way, it said. Choose, or I will take you both. Tears streamed down Emily's face, but she nodded resolutely. I love you, she said softly, stepping into the circle. And I believe in you. She placed her hand on the journal, her voice steady despite the fear in her eyes. I offer myself in place of my husband, to break the curse and end this nightmare. The air around us crackled with energy as the doppelganger screamed in rage. No, it bellowed, its form flickering wildly. The ground shook, and the shadows seemed to come alive, writhing around us. Emily's hand tightened on mine, her presence a beacon of strength and love. We can do this, she whispered. Together. Drawing on the strength of our bond, I stepped into the circle with her, our hands joined over the journal. We renounce the pact, I said firmly. We reject the curse. Take us both, or leave us in peace. The doppelganger's form wavered, its eyes blazing with fury. The shadows closed in, and for a moment, I thought we were lost. But then, a blinding light erupted from the journal, engulfing us in its warmth. The doppelganger screamed, its form dissolving into the air. The shadows retreated, and the mill grew silent once more. We stood there, breathing heavily, the weight of the curse lifting from our shoulders. The candles flickered back to life, casting a soft, soothing glow. Madame Celeste stepped forward, her face etched with relief. You did it, she said, her voice filled with awe. The curse is broken. Emily and I embraced, tears of joy and relief streaming down our faces. We had faced the darkness and emerged victorious, our love stronger than ever. As we left the mill, the first light of dawn breaking on the horizon, I felt a profound sense of gratitude. The doppelganger was gone, its power over us shattered. We had our lives back, and the future stretched out before us, bright and full of promise. The haunting was over, and we were finally free. Hey! Subscribe for more true scary stories. Story 2. The Voice of Shadows. The mansion stood at the edge of town, a relic of a forgotten era. My family had avoided it for generations, haunted by whispered tales of curses and restless spirits. Yet, here I was, standing before the ancient structure, keys in hand, a weight of inevitability pressing down on my shoulders. My curiosity had always been my undoing, and the discovery of an old family book in my grandmother's attic had sealed my fate. The air was thick with the scent of decay as I pushed open the creaking door. The house was in disrepair, long abandoned by the living but still very much alive with memories. Dust motes danced in the dim light that filtered through the grime-coated windows. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, the sensation of eyes following my every move. I made my way to the library, the heart of the mansion, where generations of my ancestors had gathered knowledge and secrets. The room was as I imagined, walls lined with towering bookshelves, filled with tomes that held the weight of centuries. In the center of the room was a grand, mahogany desk, an artifact of another time, covered in a thick layer of dust. The book I had found, bound in cracked leather, seemed to pulse with an almost palpable energy. Its pages were yellowed and brittle, 
the ink faded yet legible. My grandmother had spoken of it only once, with a fear in her eyes that I had never seen before. She had begged me to leave it alone, to let the past remain buried. But the allure was too strong. I sat at the desk, the book before me, and began to read. The words were in an archaic script, difficult to decipher, but I pressed on, driven by a force I couldn't explain. As I read aloud, the shadows in the room seemed to thicken, growing darker and more oppressive. I felt a chill run down my spine, the air around me growing colder with each word I spoke. It wasn't until I reached the end of the first passage that I realized something was terribly wrong. My voice had taken on a different timbre, deeper and more resonant, echoing through the room in a way that was not natural. I tried to stop, but the words kept coming, spilling from my lips in a language I didn't understand. The shadows coalesced, forming shapes that writhed and twisted, growing ever closer. Panic set in as I struggled to regain control, my hands gripping the edges of the desk until my knuckles turned white. The darkness enveloped me, and I felt a presence, ancient and malevolent, pressing against my mind. My vision blurred, and the last thing I saw before everything went black was a pair of glowing eyes staring at me from the void. I awoke in darkness, the cold seeping into my bones. Disoriented, I tried to recall how long I had been unconscious. The memory of those glowing eyes lingered, a haunting reminder of the malevolent force I had unleashed. My throat felt raw, as if I had been screaming for hours. I stumbled to my feet, the world around me spinning, and reached for my phone. It was dead, of course. The library was unchanged, but the air was now suffused with a sense of dread. Shadows still clung to the corners of the room, darker and more oppressive than before. I had to find a way to stop whatever I had started. Desperation clawed at my mind as I fumbled through the pages of the book, searching for answers. In the dim light, I noticed a passage I had overlooked before, hidden in the margins of the text. It spoke of a ritual to bind the spirits, to lock them away once more. But it required a sacrifice, something of great personal value. My heart sank as I realized what it meant. The book had taken hold of my voice, and now it demanded a price for its secrets. I needed to understand more about my family's connection to this cursed place. Digging through the dusty shelves, I found an old journal, its leather cover worn and cracked. The name on the first page was familiar, my great-great-grandfather, Thomas Whitaker. His entries were filled with references to the book, to rituals, and to a spirit he had named the Shadow King. Thomas had been a man of ambition, seeking power through forbidden knowledge. He had summoned the Shadow King, binding it to the mansion in exchange for prosperity. But the spirit had twisted his wish, bringing ruin upon our family instead. The mansion had become a prison, not just for the spirit but for our family's souls, doomed to relive their mistakes through each generation. I felt a cold hand brush my shoulder, and I turned to see a figure standing in the doorway. It was my grandmother, or rather, her ghost. Her eyes were hollow, filled with sorrow and regret. You shouldn't have come here, she whispered, her voice echoing in the silence. The book's power is too great. You must find a way to end this. Her form flickered, and she reached out to me her touch freezing. There's a way, she said, her voice trembling. But it requires a sacrifice. Your own blood, your own essence. Only then can you bind the spirit and free us all. I nodded, my mind racing. I couldn't leave my family to suffer any longer. Gathering my courage, I searched the library for anything that could help me. I found a small, ceremonial knife, its blade still sharp despite the years. Taking a deep breath, I prepared myself for what had to be done. 
As I made the first cut, the shadows in the room surged forward, drawn to the blood. Pain shot through me, but I didn't stop, repeating the words from the ritual passage. The room grew colder, the air filled with whispers and cries. The shadows writhed and twisted, forming a vortex around me. Just as I felt I could bear no more, the darkness exploded outward, and a deafening silence fell. I collapsed to the floor, weak and trembling, but alive. The book lay closed on the desk, its power dormant once more. But I knew this was only the beginning. The Shadow King was bound, but not defeated. The real battle was yet to come. The house felt different now, but the weight of what I had done lingered heavily. I knew the mansion's secrets ran deeper than the book and the ritual. The whispers had not ceased, only grown quieter, retreating into the dark corners of the estate. Exhausted but resolute, I decided to explore further, seeking any clues that might help me in the inevitable confrontation with the Shadow King. The hallways were a labyrinth of dust and decay, each turn revealing more of the mansion's opulent past. Portraits of my ancestors lined the walls, their eyes seeming to follow me as I walked. One painting, in particular, caught my attention, a woman with a stern expression, her eyes cold and unforgiving. The plaque beneath read, Margaret Whitaker, 1882. Something about her gaze unsettled me, as if she knew my every secret. In one of the unused bedrooms, I found a hidden door behind a rotting tapestry. The narrow passageway beyond was barely wide enough to squeeze through, leading down into the depths of the mansion. I descended, my footsteps echoing ominously in the confined space. The air grew colder, and the whispers returned, growing louder with each step. At the bottom of the stairs, I found myself in a forgotten cellar, filled with the remnants of failed experiments and dark rituals. The walls were covered in cryptic symbols, etched into the stone with a precision that spoke of madness and obsession. In the center of the room was an altar, stained with blood and surrounded by the tools of some ancient, sinister practice. As I examined the symbols, a sudden gust of wind extinguished my flashlight. The darkness was absolute, and the whispers turned to screams. I felt a presence behind me, cold and oppressive, pressing against my mind. A voice, deep and malevolent, echoed in the room. You cannot escape, it hissed. The blood of Whitaker binds you to me. I spun around, and in the dim light of the altar's dying embers, I saw a figure emerging from the shadows. It was Thomas Whitaker, or what remained of him. His eyes glowed with an unnatural light, and his body was twisted and broken. You must destroy the book, he rasped, his voice a tortured whisper. Only then can you sever the ties that bind us. Before I could react, the figure lunged at me, his spectral hands cold as ice. I fought back, scrambling for the ceremonial knife still tucked in my belt. The blade flashed in the darkness, and with a desperate strike, I drove it into Thomas's chest. He let out an unearthly scream, the sound reverberating through the cellar, and then he was gone, leaving only a chilling silence. Panting, I looked around, my mind racing. The book was the key, but how could I destroy something so powerful? The whispers returned, more insistent, guiding me to a hidden alcove in the wall. Inside was a small, iron box, its surface etched with the same symbols as the cellar walls. I pried it open, revealing a set of ancient scrolls, detailing a ritual of destruction. Gathering the scrolls, I made my way back to the library, my resolve hardening with each step. The mansion seemed to pulse with malevolent energy, the air thick with tension. I knew the Shadow King was aware of my intentions, and I could feel its anger growing. I had to act quickly, before it could stop me. Back in the library, I set the scrolls on the desk and began to prepare. 
the ritual required a blend of rare herbs, blood, and fire. As I worked, the shadows in the room grew restless, swirling around me like a living entity. The final step involved reading the incantation aloud, and as the words left my lips, the room erupted in chaos. The shadows screamed and writhed, and the book began to burn with an eerie, green flame. Just as I thought the ritual was succeeding, the fire exploded outward, throwing me across the room. The last thing I saw before losing consciousness was the Shadow King emerging from the flames, its form more terrifying than I could have imagined. The End Subscribe for more true scary stories. Thanks for watching.